Uh, so good morning. I uh, hope everybody has their coffee and tea and ready to go. And welcome to Longwood's Breakfast. Uh, I've been looking forward to this one uh, for some time now. I had an opportunity to meet with Rick about a year ago um, for coffee. And part of the discussion was today's event. It's good to see a number of familiar people have joined this morning. Um, and for those of you who are familiar with me and have attended breakfast in the past, you've heard what I'm about to say many times. But I don't know everyone joining here this morning. So very quickly, I am Matthew Hart, CEO for Longwoods Publishing producers of these breakfast events. Um, I enjoy meeting new people. And yes, this is a little different now, but please do feel free to contact me. I can be found on LinkedIn and my email address is mhart at longwoods.com. Before we start, it is important to say thank you to our sponsors. Uh, Jim Musica from Bridgeable, Jean-Vierre Martin from CFHI, David O'Toole from CIHI, Adonan Bat from Medtronic, Paul Haycroft from Phillips, and Michael Kahn from Workday. Thank you very much. Uh, without your support, we couldn't make this morning possible. Okay, that's it for me. If you have any questions for Rick, please feel free to use the Q&A section, and he'll do his best to address some of your questions at the end. Rick, the show is yours. Hope everyone can hear me and can see the slides. Um, I'll start off by uh, thanking uh, Longwoods and, uh, and uh, uh, Matthew uh, for this kind invitation. I really appreciate the uh, opportunity to speak with, uh, speak with you uh, this morning. Um, the, uh, um, uh, uh, and it's just a, a pleasure and a privilege. I've, uh, I've been a big fan of the, uh, this breakfast series for, uh, for, for many years and have had the opportunity to, uh, to attend several. So I'll just start off uh, very briefly this morning. Uh, as you know, normally there are no slides <laughs> at a real breakfast. Uh, it's just uh, talking and we thought we would mix things up today a little bit uh, uh, with, with a, a more slide-based uh, presentation, which I hope is all right. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, Canadian Institutes of Health Research and the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research very briefly. Just, I think almost everybody here knows what those are, but I'll give you just a very, very uh, thumbnail sketch and background. I wanna talk about learning health systems and uh, the issue of learning health systems in Canada. Uh, talk about uh, our institute's emerging priorities and the impacts of COVID-19 on our society, on health, on healthcare, and on the development of those priorities, and talk about lessons. And as I reflected on, on all this, I really wanted to talk about opportunities and focus on opportunities. And there will be 10 minutes or so, or 15 minutes at the end to, uh, to discuss, uh, to have a good discussion, I hope, and to talk about your input. Um, I do have some conflicts of interest to disclose, none with private or corporate funding, but I certainly do receive salary support uh, from various sources. Um, the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research is hosted at uh, ICES. Um, I hold research grants uh, from both CHR and the Ontario Ministry of Health, and I'm a practicing family physician, so uh, I also do bill uh, the Ontario Ministry of Health. Um, so about CHR, I think everyone pretty much is aware of the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. I just wanna highlight that its mandate is uh, several fold, particularly uh, people think of CHR as the creation of new knowledge, but in the CHR Act is also its translation into improved health and healthcare uh, and if, uh, more effective health, improved health for Canadians, more effective health services and products and a strengthened Canadian health system and building capacity to undertake these um, activities is also part of the CHR mandate. Um, the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research is one of 13 institutes that you can see on the, uh, uh, on the slide here, the one that's uh, circled and highlighted on the bottom right, dedicated to supporting innovative research, capacity building and knowledge translation activities. So again, you can see those kind of core activities but for our own institute, the mandate is about the way that um, uh, healthcare services are organized, regulated, managed, financed, paid for, used, and delivered in the interest of, of improving the health and quality of life of all Canadians. Um, I want to talk briefly about learning health system. I did put this in the title. I think it's a really important concept. Um, and there are numerous definitions. There isn't exactly an agreed upon definition, but this is one that I like. Uh, learning healthcare system is one in which science, information, incentives, and culture are aligned for continuous improvement, innovation with best practices seamlessly embedded in the care process, 
patients and families, active participants in all elements, and new knowledge captured, captured as an integral byproduct of the care experience. So you can see the numerous uh, moving parts of the learning health system um, and uh, the fact that these processes are embedded and kind of seamless in the use of best evidence and data and uh, patient family participation. Um, so do we have learning health systems in Canada? Well, uh, um, uh, CFHI and CHR uh, commissioned, uh, 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 sorry, Canadian Health Services and Policy Research Alliance, CHESPRA, and the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research uh, commissioned a report that came out uh, close to two years ago now um, uh, by John Labus and his colleagues uh, at the McMaster, at McMaster and the McMaster Health Forum on creating rapid learning health systems in Canada. Um, this is an encyclopedic uh, good read. Um, it's of course does can't include every single initiative across the country because many are local, many haven't been published, but they did find that there's no recipe, uh, but there are uh, factors or strategies um, that, that seem to be in common. There's also a rich list of assets for the health system as a whole and for the primary care sector and elderly, but notable gaps occur throughout the system in this concept of the learning health system. They talked about examples in several provinces and regions uh, that are listed there, and they noted windows of opportunity come up from time to time uh, to help create and build and spread a learning health system. And they noted some that were present at the time. And of course, this changes with uh, uh, political winds. And one of our main themes for today is to discuss the impact of COVID-19 on these windows of opportunity. Uh, they did note the, the need to develop accreditation standards and other supports for rapid learning health organizations and systems. So this is not something that is necessarily institutionally supported, uh, organized, uh, uh, and, and so on. So there's still quite a bit of work to do to develop these learning systems in Canada. The Institute of Health Services and Prior uh, Institute of Health Services and Policy Research has had priorities over time, starting with Morris Bearer as the founding scientific director, and then Colleen Flood, uh, and then Robin Tamlin, uh, and I'm uh, their successor and in many ways standing on the shoulders of those giants. But you can see as we look across time, learning health systems did appear in our 2015 to 2019 strategic plan. Um, along with some others that you can see there. And you can see lots of commonalities because of the core mandate, financing, funding, and sustainability runs really through all of IHSPR from uh, to the year 2000 when CHR was formed onwards. And you can see lots of commonality that occurs across as well, having to do with our mandate with some general topics and then some specific ones that have changed somewhat over time. So the context has changed radically, though. We're, we're now living in a, in a very different era, uh, in part because of COVID-19, and in part because issues like racism, um, uh, the uh, uh, colonization and oppression of Canada's Indigenous peoples, um, the uh, uh, recent ruling in the BC Supreme Court in the Canby case, um, uh, you can you, and and the um, uh, enormous devastation that we've seen in sectors of our healthcare system, like long-term care, from COVID-19. So, any of the kind of planning that we were doing and the um, the issues around, uh, you know, what should health services and policy research priorities be in Canada, need to, of course, to take these these more recent developments into account, and that's our focus for this morning. So we had started off on a journey that uh, all CHR institutes do uh, from time to time and that CHR itself uh, has been doing, and I'll allude to that in just a moment. Uh, but we've been engaging with patients and citizens, with our provincial funding partners, with researchers and trainees, with healthcare providers, with policy decision makers, and importantly, with partner organizations, because from what we could tell looking backwards in time, about half of health services and policy research in Canada is funded through CHR, and the other half is funded very broadly across the country 
uh, in large part by our provincial health funders, which makes sense for the healthcare system, which is largely delivered provincially and territorially. So these are the kinds of consultations we have been having and will continue to have over the coming couple of months. And the timeline here, you'll see there are no dates because of course everything has changed and been delayed. The overall CHR strategic plan uh, will be uh, uh, launched uh, early in the new year uh, and the IHSPR strategic plan in the spring. Uh, so rather than putting dates on, that's the general gist of where we're going. Uh, and along the line, we have a fantastic uh, Institute Advisory Board that has been um, uh, 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 advising us and, uh, uh, and really helping us with the development of the emerging, these emerging strategies. Uh, collective impact comes from partnerships um, and our institute works very broadly, both uh, I've mentioned uh, provincial funders, but the academic sector, the not-for-profit sector, the for-profit sector, and you'll see a number of international partners here as well, uh, as well as pan-Canadian partners that are extremely important. So just to say that we don't do our work on our own, uh, many of you will be looking for and will find your logos on this uh, page and, and many of you have relationships with CHR and with the Institute of Health Services and Policy Research. So what did what have we heard so far? So um, you have the opportunity to kind of weigh in uh, on, on our priorities as they're developing. And some of the overarching themes that we've heard are that our health system needs fundamental reform. Uh, we could tinker on the edges, we could work on things uh, on, on, on the side, uh, we could focus on specific things, but I'll, I'll, I'll demonstrate in a moment why we think that the health system itself, and the health system has a number of re really important strengths, uh, but it really has not kept up with the times. It was designed in the 1970s, 60s, 70s, 80s maybe, and has really not kept up with the modern era. And we, Canada has fallen quite far behind many other countries in the world, which I'll demonstrate in a moment. So we have a tremendous opportunity building from a base of strength. Uh, we have uh, well-trained health professionals. We have a pretty solid workforce. Um, but we are just not organized as a healthcare system in a way that would the 21st century would require. We also know that evidence does not reliably inform policy or practice. We know health services and policy research is quite famous or infamous for not always having uh, or often not having an impact on how decisions are made, either clinical decisions, policy decisions, um, uh, how the system works. Uh, and we also need to leverage technology and data. We know that uh, uh, these things have, uh, 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 data has changed a, a huge amount um, and that technology has changed a huge amount. And you can only see what's happening with virtual care and the pandemic to understand the promise and also some of the perils of technology that ne we need to attend to. So this slide kind of sums up, um, uh, uh, <laughs> although very hard to do in one slide, some of the structural issues in our healthcare system. So you can see that our, 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 uh, the way that our system is organized is not really the way you would do it if you were starting from scratch with a health system. So we have different sectors and my apologies, I've not listed all the sectors here, mental health care, mental, mental health system, the home and community system are all extremely important. Many other systems are, pharmaceuticals are, they're the rap most rapidly growing, but we know that hospitals are, tend to be funded through global budgets, long-term care, through the number of beds. Uh, physicians are funded still in this country, although there is a lot of uh, alternate payment, there's still the majority are paid through fee for service. Um, all of these sectors are paid from separate budgets through separate branches of ministries, sometimes multiple ministries. And you can see the, the uh, hun hundreds of billions of dollars that we spend every year on healthcare. So uh, the picture of the silos is uh, intentional here. Um, and when we think about the system, the system tends to focus on hospitals rather than the community. It focuses on illness rather than wellness, and it focuses on individuals rather than populations. And uh, for that reason, we've missed a lot of opportunities to make upstream uh, impacts. Uh, we know we have long waits. When I travel internationally, people come and give talks, people come up to me one by one and say, um, Rick, when is Canada gonna fix those waiting wait list problems, those waiting problems that you have? So we're kind of unfortunately known around the world for that. I was definitely noted in the Canby case that waits are unacceptably long and not only in British Columbia, this occurs right across the country. 
uh, has been, of course, made quite a bit worse by, by uh, uh, COVID-19. We know we have a serious inequities in access and outcomes, and we know that patient and public voices are insufficiently heard, and we know that during COVID-19 that has actually worsened. The other, the other thing just to focus on for a moment is that we have um, uh, the, the, uh, the sector uh, in our system that is responsible for generating most of the prescriptions, uh, most of the tests, most of the decisions to admit and discharge patients um, are doctors. Uh, in some cases, nurse practitioners, um, again, largely paid by fee for service where there are few accountabilities, weak measurement, few networks, little governance, not many teams and not organized or connected uh, very well in most settings to the rest of the system. So that the many of the consequential decisions are being made in a way that are not necessarily organized or linked to the rest of the system and they're very weak accountabilities across these different sectors. Um, when we think about our health system, we should also think about the contacts that Canadians have. So this is a thousand people. I will credit the work of uh, Moira Stewart and her, uh, her colleagues. Uh, so of a thousand people in the population, more than half have a chronic condition these days. And this is a dramatic change from even 30, 40 years ago. Uh, many of those people have multiple chronic conditions and we don't have guidelines or approaches or organized care to those people with multimorbidity. About 235 visit their family physician, about 70 visit a physician other than a family physician, about 32 see a nurse and about eight stay overnight in a hospital. And so you could say that the focus of our healthcare system is not out here where prevention can make a big difference uh, with these thousand people, uh, many of whom do not yet have a chronic condition, but many of whom have uh, treatable risk factors uh, uh, like alcohol, smoking, substance use, diet, lack of exercise, stress, and so on. We know that for people who do have a chronic condition, we are, do not do a very good job in this country on self-management or self-management programs or organized self-management or setting goals or attaining goals or helping people to attain their goals. We also know that we insufficiently support primary care uh, through the four C's, the first contact access, continuity, comprehensiveness, and coordination. They do exist. Uh, they are supported to some degree through models like the medical home model, but we have insufficient support to make this the cornerstone and, and, and front door uh, and an accessible, timely accessible front door to our healthcare system. Much more work to do there. We know that we have an, uh, an opportunity to integrate across all of these sectors, including home and community care, including mental health care, our hospitals, our long-term care homes, and so on. And we don't do a very good job with integration and transitions between one sector and another can be quite perilous. Um, and we know we have tremendous opportunity for teamwork. We know that nurses, social workers, nurse practitioners, pharmacists, uh, uh, mental health workers, and many others can make huge contributions across all of these sectors. And very often they don't work to the top of their licenses. They don't work in organized teams uh, where they could make the biggest impact. And very few actually are in uh, an insufficient number in community settings. And you can see that we do have this hospital emphasis. And I'm not saying, of course, that we shouldn't be looking after people in the hospital and hospitals shouldn't be appropriately supported. The point I'm making is that of the $264 billion we spend each year in Canada, we have an insufficient focus on these community uh, non-hospital sectors that can help uh, both with reducing the inflow into hospitals and also the flow out of hospitals where patients back up into the emergency department. The other thing is that uh, most of healthcare is not determined, most of, most of health is not determined by healthcare. So this is from the Canadian Medical Association. Uh, nobody knows the exact number, but their estimate was only about 25% of health outcomes are actually due to health care um, and that your life, income, disability, education, social exclusion, gender, race, uh, indigenous status, et cetera, uh, along with the environment uh, uh, comprise 60% of the determinants of health, uh, the majority, and we really pay uh, a very insufficient uh, attention to those upstream determinants of health. They seem to comprise about, according to most estimates, about 3% of all health spending is on prevention and all of public health. So if you think about where we're putting our resources, uh, we, we're not putting them upstream as a rule. 
So um, I want to tackle each of this. So that was uh, kind of talking about our health system and uh, 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 the issues in our health system. I want to talk about the difficulty of getting evidence into policy and practice. And uh, here we've had a tremendous effort by the Canadian Health Services and Policy Research Alliance or CHESPRA, uh, which is comprised of about 40 members, uh, uh, organizational members uh, across the country, um, uh, our, our, our uh, 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 provincial research funders, the charitable section, the uh, sector, the academic sector, CHR and many others have been participating uh, in CHESPRA over the last number of years. Uh, the vision here is that research intelligence drives health system transformation in Canada. And there have been three streams of work, one on training modernization, uh, one on impact assessment, and one on learning health systems. And again, the goal here is about bridging that huge divide between evidence and policy and practice. And uh, CHESPRA has been working very actively in this setting. One of the key elements has been modernizing training for our doctoral and postdoctoral uh, 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 trainees. And this has been to support impact oriented career paths to expand and enrich traditional training environments and to increase research talent within health system organizations. And this is something called the Health System Impact Fellowship. Uh, many of you have had health system impact fellows in your organization. I'm delighted to let you know that this is relaunching very soon. It has been delayed by the pandemic, but we'll, we'll be relaunching very soon. So you will be getting messages about that. Um, and the goal here is to prepare the next generation of health services and policy PhD graduates with the professional skills, competencies, experience and network to make meaningful and impactful contributions. So there have been uh, over 100, uh, 150 uh, fellows uh, currently or formerly in this program. Uh, and many are in non-traditional roles in our healthcare system or hybrid roles in academia uh, because there are fewer academic positions than before. We have a real opportunity to make a difference in the healthcare system with these really well-trained people who also get oriented to working in health system organizations. Um, uh, assessing the impact of health services and policy research is challenging, it's difficult as it is with all research investments because the, the goods that we purchase are happening into the future and they're often nonlinear and complex. So this is about pathways to impact, uh, developing a menu uh, of indicators and methods and tools and communicating impact uh, through, through, uh, 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 through methods like narrative impact statements. So these are new frameworks for demonstrating, measuring and communicating the impact of health services and policy research and new tools and resources for implementing the framework and training in the community. Um, I'm gonna to shift to the third topic. So the first was the healthcare system. The second was the difficulty of getting evidence into practice. And the third is about technology and data. And I'll just show you a tiny bit here about where Canada sits. Um, I've highlighted Canada, although we didn't need to, it's sitting very far over to the left at 22% of offering patients the option to communicate via email or a secure website about a medical problem. So if you can imagine uh, in the modern era, um, that we lag behind uh, 10 other countries. This is the Commonwealth Fund, the 2019 Commonwealth Fund study of providers. And you can see that the other 10 countries, uh, many are, are approaching three quarters or even up to 90% uh, of, uh, of practices that offer uh, this very simple uh, ordinary method of communication, which most of us take for granted in every other aspect of our lives. So Canada is certainly a laggard here. And same, we have company now offering uh, requests for appointments online, refill for, for requesting re prescription refills, requesting online results, viewing on online results and viewing patient summaries online. You can see that we have some company here at the bottom with some other countries, but 1% is pretty rotten. It, it, it does require all four of these, but Canada is a laggard in all of these areas. And you can see that no one is now up to 80 or 90%, but there are countries reaching 50%, including the US that we normally think of in a way that is uh, not complementary to the Canadian healthcare system. We think of it as being in many ways inferior and not providing good access. But on the technology front, the US is well ahead of us as are many other countries. 
And these are fairly simple technologies that are available in many settings in Canada. They're just not generally available or available in a widespread way. But these are not new cutting edge technologies. These have been available for a very long time. And many of you will know that you can do this at your dental office or in many other offices. So just our failure to implement technology is, uh, uh, is, is, is um, a somewhat breathtaking. Um, so I'm going to come to our three, um, uh, our three uh, emerging priorities, I would say. So the first is re-envisioning the healthcare system to achieve the quadruple aim and health equity for all. So I think as most people uh, uh, this morning know, uh, the quadruple aim is about patient experience, uh, population health, uh, reducing or controlling costs, and about the care team's well-being. And uh, to this, we will we have certainly added equity. So this is uh, a, a, a very clear and very important focus that we cannot achieve the quadruple aim without a deliberate and intentional uh, focus on on equity. Um, the second emerging priority is about amplifying the use and impact of health services and policy research for improved health system performance and outcomes. You can see this uh, great divide <coughs> between uh, evidence and impact. <clears throat> with with uh, skeletons lying at the bottom of this, uh, in the, probably mainly in the form of published papers that are never used or that are not implemented. So this is about um, uh, uh, policy to ensure that healthcare and policy decisions are grounded in high quality, timely evidence stemming from strong collaborative research that is appropriately contextualized. And this is kind of the core or the heart of the learning health system. Modernizing the healthcare system with enhanced access to digital data, digital health solutions and data science. Uh, is incredibly important. And as you've seen, we have major gaps uh, in that area. Okay, so moving on to the pandemic. So, and then we had a pandemic. So uh, colleagues of mine who came back from March break remarked that healthcare has changed more in the past two weeks than in the past 20 years since they graduated. The majority of care in Canada has gone virtual and it did so in a few days in the middle of March. Lack of protective uh, personal equipment, personal protective equipment or PPE limited care options, increased anxiety and increased risk. Uh, many community providers were unable to provide in-person care because of lack of PPE. Uh, family physicians and specialists in particular in community settings are small business people had to procure PPE themselves and had to do these runs to Costco in a completely unsupported way and, when the, and pay for it themselves. And when the supplies were out, they were out. So <clears throat> this kind of highlights the disconnected. Uh, there were a few exceptions where, 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 where this was supported, but not very many across the country. And there was a decline, a, a sharp decline in visits in April and May, a severely stressed fee-for-service practices. And we know that quite a number actually closed in addition to not providing in-person care. We know that a number of physicians uh, uh, stopped practicing at that time. Um, we know that uh, in the population, there's been fear, anxiety, confusion, misinformation. We know that mental health, substance use, and domestic uh, violence have increased dramatically. We know about the enormous economic, educational, and caregiving impact. And we know there have been differential impacts on women, low income, and racialized groups. So the pandemic has had a huge impact on all of these things. It's exposed these societal fault lines. They've always been there, but they are now much more out in the open. Um, ageism, racism, sexism, uh, classism, um, and the intersectionality uh, that we find between these categories is much harder to deny or to ignore. The health system fault lines of neglect of long-term care and other community sectors like primary care and home care, uncoordinated jurisdictions and sectors, inconsistent attention to evidence and messaging, um, anybody uh, here had an inconsistent message about Halloween, for example, and COVID-19 in, um, in their settings. Uh, I know that, that we have. Uh, poor data systems, lack of transparency, and patient and public even more left out. So we know that some public health units have been faxing <clears throat> their COVID-19 results up the system to the province and then to the to, to Public Health Agency of Canada. I'll just demonstrate for those of you who know Toronto, and I know that this breakfast used to be more geographically located than it is now, but the center core of Toronto was popularized in the poverty by postal code report about 20 years ago. So the central part here is higher income and less diverse 
And these are lower income, the Northwest and parts of Scarborough are much more diverse in low income areas. And this is exactly where COVID has, uh, the, these are COVID cases uh, from last, uh, uh, from time period, just from a few days ago or last week. And you can see the Eastern part and particularly the Northwest of the city are, are extremely hard hit. This is what privilege looks like. Uh, those of us who are at home, able to work from home, able to keep our income streams going, um, and who are white and who are wealth, relatively wealthy. Uh, in the city of Toronto, white populations comprise about half of the population, but experienced only 18% of COVID cases. And again, this is people socially isolating, working from home, having the ability to do that, not working on the front line uh, in factories or as grocery clerks or as personal support workers not coming back to crowded multi-generational homes where they were unable to distance, as you can see with disproportionate uh, Black and South, Asia, South Asian or Indo-Caribbean and, and uh, many other uh, non-white populations. Uh, we also know that racism um, uh, is, uh, has become uh, a major issue. We know that we don't have data either at CHR or across our healthcare systems to adequately address the issue of racism. And we know there's much work to do. We know it has to be careful and sensitive. And it has to be for a purpose to address inequities, but we know we have a long way to go with that. We also know that uh, Indigenous, uh, we think of uh, 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 Indigenous issues as being in others, as mainly being in other sectors, uh, like education with residential schools or the criminal justice system uh, or in child protection. But I think many of us have been uh, uh, rattled to the core uh, with revelations in our healthcare system uh, that are obviously, uh, obviously reflections of systemic racism. Um, uh, this is uh, 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 Joyce Echequan's uh, uh, death, which was uh, uh, recorded and has really shocked the country. Um, uh, this is uh, Brian Sinclair, uh, who spent an unbelievable amount of time in a Winnipeg uh, emergency department before dying without having been assessed or treated. And we know that we have uh, an increasing number of reports uh, about uh, healthcare and uh, Indigenous populations. And uh, uh, we have a lot of work to do in this sector. So I'll just share with you, just to sort of come to more of our wrap up and time for a couple of questions, is that IHSPR's COVID-19 priorities have been published. Uh, you're welcome to have a, a look at them. Uh, they do in include uh, system adaptation and organization of care, resource allocation and decision-making, rapid synthesis and comparative policy analysis, health workforce, virtual care, longer term consequences of COVID-19 and public and patient engagement with a number of really important cross-cutting themes, including supporting the health of Indigenous peoples, data and learning health systems. The, um, the update that we would make to this is a new focus that's a really important focus on long-term care where more than 80% of COVID deaths have occurred in Canada, greater emphasis on virtual care because of the dramatic change in how care is being provided, addressing systemic racism, and the health of Indi Canada's Indigenous peoples. Uh, we are really pleased, uh, so these are just the last couple of slides, we're really pleased to be uh, partnering with the Canadian Foundation for Healthcare Improvement and the Canadian Patient Safety Institute in their Long-Term Care Plus initiative to support Canada's uh, long-term care and retirement homes, uh, dealing with these six promising practices uh, for long-term care and retirement. Uh, this is now spread to more than 200 and will be spreading to a much larger number of uh, retirement and, and uh, long-term care homes across Canada. And we're really delighted that with CFHI support uh, at CHR, with the participation of six of our 13 institutes and three provinces, we've been able to roll out implementation science teams uh, that will be across the country and that will support implementation efforts and sustainability of these promising practices will rigorously evaluate their outcomes and will improve long-term care preparedness. So just finally, um, the lessons or opportunities of COVID-19 for Canadian learning health systems uh, to, to me anyway are about addressing systemic racism, are about making a massive leap forward in data and digital health, about investing in compassionate and evidence-based care of older adults, about empowering patients, families, citizens, and caregivers in new ways, building and testing new models of governance, integration, payment, and care delivery, and using meaningful data to inform decisions that enhance impact and equity. So we do have about 10 minutes or maybe a little bit less than 10 minutes, maybe nine minutes. 
um, for uh, your comments and, and questions. So I guess we would ask what in this plan or this set of emerging priorities appeals to you and what does not, what needs more emphasis or less, and especially what do you find is missing? So I'm going to stop um, sharing the slides now so that I can see the chat, I hope. And um, uh, I would welcome your uh, uh, comments and, uh, uh, and suggestions. So um, I have a question that I'll start with uh, from Philip Berger. Thank you, Philip, and thank you for joining us this morning. So if illicit drug dealers can get their products to every community in Canada in a good time and quantity, why cannot government authorities do the same with the flu vaccine? So um, uh, Philip, I, I, I know that's probably uh, a rhetorical question, um, but it, it, is, uh, um, uh, it, it, it is the case that we're challenged uh, with the flu vaccine this year. Um, and I know that authorities uh, who know a lot more than I do could speak to this question, but um, it, 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 is, it is true that we have had a minority of people uh, in, in this country uh, vaccinated for uh, influenza over the years, um, and uh, that in our dual pandemic of COVID-19 and flu, uh, we do know that many more people need to be vaccinated. Uh, so, I'm, uh, uh, please feel free to uh, uh, to oh oh sorry I'm going to go sorry that was in the that was in the chat um, and I'm going to go to the um, uh, question the Q and A as well um, so will slides be available after the talk yes so I have sent a PDF uh, version uh, to uh, to Matthew and um, uh, uh, I'm I'm very happy to uh, to make the slides uh, available. Um, uh, uh, Rebecca has asked, how do we adjust the culture and focus on wellness instead of illness? Uh, that's a great question, and I think that's something that I don't have a simple answer to, but that we can, uh, that we can do in partnership together with our policymakers and with our health system, uh, is to really think about the upstream determinants of health, to really think about how we intervene on those determinants of health, I think COVID-19 has given us an opportunity for things that we thought uh, were off the table, like a basic income, for example. We, that's kind of what we have now through a lot of the government programs that are rolling out. Um, uh, so making sure that people have food, have a roof over their head. These are the kinds of things that I think have reached uh, uh, national attention and we're open to different kinds of um, different kinds of thinking about those social determinants of health. Uh, thinking about wellness, of course, uh, is uh, uh, the domain of many sectors, uh, including uh, housing, food, recreation, the way our cities are designed is incredibly important for that too. And I think there, there's a growing awareness of those things. Um, uh, Megan McMahon has asked or has commented, has COVID shifted the emphasis on research priorities or revealed new areas war warranting attention? How has COVID affected or influenced ISPER's thinking about future directions for health services priorities? So um, I think that we actually have in some, to some degree, Meg, shifted our priorities as you know well. Um, I think long-term care was on our radar, but was not a major focus at the very beginning of our, of our discourse across the country, and it is now. So I think COVID-19 has both exposed new areas and has also, uh, I, I think, shifted. Things like virtual care, of course, were on our radar, but now that most care is being provided, majority of care in the community is now being provided virtually, and we don't know for whom it's most effective, which conditions, are best treated that way, how uh, durable this will be, what payment systems would best support it, et cetera. Uh, so I think there are both uncovering of existing uh, issues and actually a pivot to new things like virtual care and long-term care uh, in our own thinking and I hope in the thinking of healthcare systems and healthcare funders and health partners uh, across the country. Um, Somebody has asked what is holding Canada back when it comes to leveraging technology. Um, it's, uh, um, uh, again, others know much more than I do uh, about this, uh, but um, uh, I think part of it is the fragmentation across our different sectors. 
you know, we tend to set out to build a lab system that is not necessarily connected to a hospital system, that is not necessarily connected to a system that doctors in the community or that PSWs or that anybody else would be using. And then we're doing that through 13 different jurisdictions, all with different approaches and mandates and purchasing. So having some kind of national strategy, and I know that we do, I know that Canada Health InfoWay and others are working uh, uh, on this, but um, we, we really don't have integration across our sectors or an idea. Many European countries now have a single record for a single patient. They have multiple systems, but they're interoperable. And there's one record for one patient uh, in many European countries now. And we need that kind of a vision. And I would see it as a patient held record and patients could give people in their circle of care uh, access um, to that. Um, the, um, just looking down uh, the list, knowing that we only have about three minutes left. Um, uh, biggest change or innovation required in Canada is to scale and spread digital health solutions that have proven to be successful. So there are a few that have spread and scaled. So eConsult that was uh, um, developed uh, uh, in uh, Ottawa by the University of Ottawa by Claire Liddy and her colleagues has really spread across numerous provinces now, but it's a, uh, a and it's extremely compelling. Uh, you can get a consultation from a specialist in a couple of days, uh, very often saving an in-person consultation in a system that's severely overstressed uh, with long waits for specialists. So it's uh, cost, it, it, it appears to be cost-effective, it gets rapid results, and it is spreading very widely. We would hope that uh, that kind of compelling uh, argument would help for other uh, uh, electronic and uh, uh, information technologies to be more widely spread. And I think having much more provincial, territorial, federal collaboration around technology would be uh, very helpful. Um, uh, how can you share these ideas with ISPER? Um, I think actually, you know what? I did not show the last uh, slide, um, which had our emails on it. So uh, 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 in, instead of sharing the screen in the last minute, uh, uh, you can certainly write to us. Um, uh, uh, you can uh, reach me at uh, rglazier.ihspr uh, at ices.on.ca. Uh, you can certainly we, uh, uh, write us at CIHR and they'll direct it to the right place. Uh, you will, um, uh, Longwoods will make the slide deck available and my contact and Megan McMahon's and Jessica Nadigal's. I also had a nice slide of our team that I'm really sorry I didn't get a chance to show. Um, so uh, our contacts are on the slide deck and can be found either through Longwoods or CIHR, but we'd be uh, delighted to hear from you. I'm, I'm aware um, that we only have about a minute left. Um, and uh, my favorite provocateur, Doris Greenspun has asked, missing is a complete shift from hospital care to community care and for illness to prevention with a focus on social determinants of health. So we agree on that, Doris, for sure. What will it take? Um, so in the remaining 30 seconds, I'm not able to answer that, but Doris, you have been a champion and a very effective champion for that approach. And I would love, and we would love to follow up with you um, on that. Rick, thank you very much. Um, we will uh, keep the questions and uh, send them to Rick. And then if he has a chance, maybe even on Twitter or something like that, if there's a quick little response that he may be able to give, we'll see whether or not we're able to do that. Um, again, thank you. The slides and the video will be available very shortly. And uh, our next breakfast is the end of November. It's on digital health. It'll feature uh, Lydia Lee from KPMG, Gigi Osler, the past president of uh, CMA, and Duska Kennedy from North York General. Uh, again, thank you very much and have a great day. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.